And I can't think of a better way to start this than with the guy who started this symposium back in 2000 and who has been the leading advocate for it for so long when he was running the Center for UP Studies and the Department of History, uh, and that is Dr. Russell Minyagi. So I'd like to welcome Russ up to the stage. All right, you're all set. Okay, thank you. I can okay, as I guess I would say, uh, the granddaddy of the Sonderegger Symposium, I have some additional general comments uh, to make. Uh, and I too welcome, welcome everybody. And we've had, over the years, uh, you should remember that we've had uh, literally dozens and dozens of presentations, papers uh, that would have never been presented. Some of them have gone on to be published. Some are available electronically. And it's, uh, what, what you find is, and it continues to be a problem, uh, once you cross the bridge, the people downstate, I'm sorry, don't care about the UP. And you can argue that, yes we do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've seen it happen too often, uh, personally, and in general. And so the Sonderegger Symposium is the only uh, conference that brings the whole Upper Peninsula uh, together, presents it uh, to the public. And uh, as I said, we've had, uh, well, you can go on, online. I have a, uh, I'm the editor of Upper Country. It's, it's available online and one of the one of the uh, recent um, articles listed all of the uh, presentations from the beginning and you just go through that and it's uh, amazing in terms of uh, the people that came and the various presentations that uh, that were put on over the years and as I said well the uh, Historical Society of Michigan puts on a uh, summer conference, and there's a number of uh, papers and so on dealing with the UP, but this is sort of the grand uh, presentation of the history of the, uh, the, the heritage of the, uh, of the region. Now this morning, I'm, uh, uh, Dan mentioned, uh, mentioned some points. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about what we knew about the region that the Cass Expedition would come into. And uh, we can go back to, um, we find that uh, prior to the Cass Expedition of 18, uh, 1820, there was a great deal of knowledge about the Upper Peninsula, Lake Superior, uh, the area of Wisconsin and so on, uh, that had been known going back to the time of Jacques Cartier, 1535. And at that time, uh, Cartier had been sent uh, by the King of France to explore uh, this western country, uh, but primarily f uh, trying to find a, a route to the western sea that was one reason. The other reason was to find gold and silver. So how to, uh, how to find some instant wealth and also the route to the Western Sea, the Pacific, uh, that would bring them to uh, Asia and the, the, markets, uh, the markets in Asia. Uh, at this point, uh, they hadn't quite got into the, into the fur trade. So you're going to find that Cartier uh, talks to the, to the native people about what is in this country. I, is there gold and silver and so on? And they do point out that there's a red metal uh, far to the west, and they talk about a sweet water uh, sea, Lake Superior, or Lake Huron, Lake Superior. Uh, so we get, at that time, in the 1530s, we get the first... Uh, inf uh, general information about the country that the Cass expedition would uh, would visit. 
Uh, the Jesuit missionaries then uh, become the next chroniclers of the, of the region. Now, the Jesuit missionaries um, were, many of them were, they, they were trained as rel religious, but they also had, usually had a master's degree in some other non-religious uh, subject, uh, mathematics, uh, geography. Uh, they all learned the languages of the Native Americans that they were going to encounter, so they didn't need a translator. And so what you have are kind of a core of, wait, shoot. Okay, there we have Jacques Cartier, let's see. Okay, the, uh, so the, the Jesuit missionaries uh, wrote really dynamite reports from the 1660s uh, forward, and they detailed uh, the environment and the people of the region. And what they were, what they were doing was uh, obtaining information uh, as to where the native people were, what the environment was like, what they would have to encounter as they moved into, in this case, the Lake Superior country. And they went into uh, detail about, uh, about Lake Superior uh, and the environment uh, the clarity of the water, the tremendous storms that could arise on the lake. And so if you just use their accounts, you get from the 16, uh, 1660s and after you get a very detailed uh, study of, the, uh, uh, of lake, lake Superior and the region. Um, as a matter of fact, in 16, uh, 1671, a rather accurate map uh, of Lake Superior was published from observations that were made by uh, Claude Alloway and Claude Dablon, uh, two Jesuits, and they, at different times, they went around the lake, they circumnavigated the lake, and in their bouncing canoes, uh, went and drew a map of the lake. You have to remember, when you look at this, there is no other map of Lake Superior. This is it. This is the first map of the lake. And I first came across this at a, at a uh, talk at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And the fellow went and took a NOAA, a NOAA map, so a very accurate map of the region, and placed it over this map and except for, I think, uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula tilting a little to the east and a few other minor, minor points uh, on the map, it is an accurate map. Uh, some people uh, will ask the question, how did we get Isle Royal? Isle Royal is off of Thunder Bay. It's, and if you look at a map, it's, um, um, it should be in Canada. And what happened was in 1750, a uh, cartographer in Paris, I guess, decided that, you know, what is this Lake Superior? Who knows what it is or if anyone's going to go there? And so he decided to ingratiate himself to his boss or bosses. And so he creates a fab, I, I don't have a map of it, but he creates a fat map of Lake Superior with a bunch of islands. And the islands were all named for, in many cases, the wives of uh, the, uh, the uh, people in the um, Department of the Marine. So he was ingratiating himself. And that map is the map that they used uh, when they decided the boundary after the American Revolution. And the map has Isle Royal to the south of where it is. So it makes sense when they drew the map, they just drew it to the north of Isle Royal. A hundred years later in the 1850s, the British re-surveyed, uh, uh, or didn't re they surveyed the uh, Lake Superior, and my oh my, Isle Royal is north of that, north of the original boundary. Uh, so that's where that, uh, that, came, fr uh, that, that came from. Um, uh, the other um, the other development uh, and the um, 
the Jesuits then published all of their uh, letters and reports and so on in the Jesuit relations, which are available uh, online today. The Peter White Library has a collection of them, if you want to look at a hard copy. And uh, all of their reports uh, were published. Did they actually get to the general population? Probably not, but uh, officials and so on were familiar with uh, the uh, 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 with, the inf uh, with the information. Um, okay, we had, uh, we have some pictures of uh, some of the Jesuit scientists and so on, but there was a, a very interesting uh, Jesuit that shows up, a fellow by the name of Louis Nicol uh, Nicolas. And the thing about him is he came to uh, he came to the, to the New World, uh, didn't want to be a missionary. He was interested in the environment, and he, and you'll see on the, the right side here, uh, he um, is going to draw the, uh, the people, uh, the animals, the, the plant life, uh, the environment, of Canada, and in many cases, Lake Superior. He was stationed at Sault Ste. Marie and then over to the west at the uh, Mission of the Holy Spirit in modern day uh, uh, Ashland, Wisconsin. And uh, the Jesuits weren't were very happy with him because he uh, felt that uh, there should be a better life for him. And for instance, when he said mass, he wanted to dress in, despite the season, he wanted to dress in gold vestments, which wasn't part of the Jesuit, uh, Jesuit routine. Uh, and uh, he then uh, spends most of his time not evangelizing, but creating this fantastic collection of pictures of the uh, Canada, and we were part of Canada at that time. Uh, here you have a picture of a beaver, uh, an Ottawa Indian. And what happened, is kind of interesting as to what happened, um, this uh, document, which is a thick book, which I th either the Historical Society or the Peter Wright Library has a copy of it. I donated a copy to them. Uh, it is a large book that got lost, and uh, 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 the Reverend uh, Nicholas uh, left the Jesuits. I think they opened the door and, and pushed him out. They were glad to see him go. And he, um, so he had this book of drawings, he gave a copy to uh, Louis XIV, the king at the time, and the, um, the book then got lost. The author got lost, and it just floated around, so we have to be careful. It wasn't readily available to very many people, but it was there. And it uh, was finally picked up, uh, purchased by the um, Gilcrest um, where is it here? Yeah, the Gilcrest Museum. The Gilcrest Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma, has a thing called the Codex Canadiensis, uh, this book that, that uh, uh, Louis Nicolas created. And it is just filled, and it was published, though. The important thing is that it was published in 2011. And here he had done all this work in the 1600s. And it was this document, a document had gotten lost. Um, uh, so if you get a chance, you might want to uh, might want to look at, or, or just go online, and they have a lot of the pages from the book uh, uh, online. You can see the, the type of work. And he was not a obviously not a uh, uh, developed artist, and so on. Uh, the, the other thing that the uh, Jesuits uh, reported on in a tremendous detail uh, were the copper deposits in Lake Superior, in the Lake Superior region. Um, we have in, in the 1720s, Pierre uh, Charlevoix 
uh, described the uh, Upper Peninsula. It's interesting, he described the uh, peninsula of the Upper Peninsula as dismal. Uh, he wrote, though, there were, when you got to a place called the Manistique River, they had great sturgeon uh, in that area. And he was really hot about that. But this, this place to the north, and he was traveling along the southern shore of the Upper Peninsula, uh, it was dismal. Uh, and he did write, it was kind of interesting, uh, in, in 17, uh, 1721, he wrote of an earlier Jesuit, unfortunately he didn't name him, but he was stationed at Sault Ste. Marie, and he had been a goldsmith before he joined the Jesuits, and he was working uh, crucifixes, uh, censers to burn incense, uh, candlesticks out of locally obtained copper. So you, you begin to see these uh, connections, not only talking about copper, but you have some Jesuits actually um, uh, working with it. You also had lay, um, okay, they also talked about, they also talked about the size of the fish, the amount of, uh, the amount of fish, uh, and even some of the early maps of the Straits of Mackinac show uh, uh, labeled across the area white fish in big letters. And so you're going to have, uh, you're going to have all, of this, uh, all of this detail uh, coming out at the time. Uh, an interesting, one of the early explorers, uh, and uh, he, writes about, he writes about the region, Radisson, uh, he writes about the region in poor English, and so it becomes rather difficult to identify specific places that he's talking about. But he talks about, he travels along the southern shore of uh, uh, Lake Superior, and he also writes about buffalo in Sault Ste. Marie. And, uh, and I went and I, when it was brought to my attention, I missed it over the years, and then a friend of mine pointed this out, uh, that he had written about it, and I checked into it, the word he used for buffalo and so on, and he was using, so you basically say that some distant buffalo found their way from the plains, though buffalo did, they bypassed Michigan, they went through uh, Wisconsin and Indiana, Ohio, to at least the Appalachian Mountains. So uh, were they here? Yes, and whoops. Well, we lost it, I guess. Okay. Um, so you had you had lay uh, observers um, writing about the the Native Americans. There were other explorers like Baron de Lohatan and uh, Sierra de uh, uh, Levendre, uh, Levendre, uh who wrote reports about the region uh, to the French government. Uh, what? it out, so okay. just hit that button. Okay. Have to be careful here. Uh, in the 1730s, uh, Louis Denis, uh, Sieur de uh, Durand, uh, was the first uh, white man to develop copper deposits in the Ottenagan area. And in 1735, his shipwrights constructed the first decked vessel uh, to sail Lake Superior to explore, to use for mining. And this was done at a place called, okay, uh, Point Opin, uh, or Point uh, uh, Pine Point, which is about uh, uh, five miles on the Canadian side, five miles uh, 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 northwest of Sault Ste. Marie. It's still there, it's out by the the airport at Sault Ste. Uh, at Sault Ste. Marie, um, it's a big vacation place. Uh, but if uh, but on the map, it's protected from uh, it, uh, the peninsula. Kind of curves around and protects it from the from bad weather. And there were a lot of uh, uh, pine trees in the area. And you're going to find that uh, 1735, they build the first first ship. 
During the British regime, uh, shipbuilding site continued to be used. Other large uh, ships were constructed. There was the Athabasca in 1786, the Otter in 1793, the Invincible around 1802. By 1807, the red and white pine along the sandbanks were noticeably, noticeably gone. However, the northwestern, um, and that was part of a fur company, shipwrights continued to build ships in the area. And Alexander Henry, Englishman, uh, builds a uh, first air furnace at the point to assay minerals. Various British visitors and writers informed audiences of the uh, environment of Lake Superior. Jonathan Carver, Massachusetts born, was a colonel in the colonial army and he was an explorer and writer who went through the West seeking the Northwest Passage. In 1778, he published Travels Through America in the years 1766, 67, and 68 and it became a popular journal of the region and was wi widely read by Henry Schoolcraft, who will be on the Cass Expedition. Um, the uh, popularity of Carver's work provided Americans and Michiganders uh, with insights into the region and the quality of its land and people. Uh, Schoolcraft pointed out that he found the book uh, useful and indicated that from his personal experiences, Carver had visited uh, the places he had wrote about. Uh, the, geographer, the American geographer uh, Jedediah Morris published, there is some place, well, they're floating around. Uh, he published The American Geography, or A View of the Present Situation of the United States in 1789. This classic work was read and studied by many Americans. In it, he described the copper and fishery of Lake Superior, uh, the beauty of Sault Ste. Marie. Although he inaccurately located the copper deposits in the Tequamanan area and on islands in the eastern end of Lake Superior, he did provide a route for its passage to the passage of copper to uh, New York. Uh, he concluded by saying the cheapness and ease for which any quantity of the ore may be procured will make up for the distance and expense of transportation. Of the Lake Superior fishery, he continued, this lake abounds with fish, particularly trout and sturgeon. The former weigh from 12 to 50 pounds and are caught almost any season of the year in great plenty. The terrible uh, savage storms of the lake were described as making navigation uh, particularly dangerous. Uh, Morris concluded uh, with a note for the tourists, the entrance into this lake is from the Straits of, Su of Saint Marie, uh, affords one of the most pleasing prospects in the world. So he's an early promoter of tourism uh, into Lake Superior. At approximately, approximately the same time, John Long visited uh, the Lake Superior region as a fur trader, and in a work, Voyages and Travels of an Indian Interpreter and Trader, published in 1791, uh, he described aspects of the Upper Peninsula, went into detail about Native Americans, especially in the Lake Nipigon, which would be in the northwest corner of Lake Superior. He noted that Indian corn and hard grease were the food all traders carry into the upper country. He, also, he was also impressed by the abundance of fish, pickerel, trout, and whitefish of uncommon size in Lake Superior. He also wrote of the great size of Lake Superior and noted that as water, water was so clear that sturgeon could clearly be seen to a great depth. The land which became the state of Michigan remained in British control until the Uh, let's see, until the ratification of the of Jay's Treaty. Uh, according to the terms of the treaty, the British uh, agreed to evacuate their military posts in the Great Lakes region by June of 1796, which they did. And then American control over the region was slowly imposed. Mackinac Island continued as the military, governmental, and commercial center of the Upper Peninsula. 
So at this point, you have an American presence. Uh, but as we'll see, that does not, uh, there's still a reason for the CAS expedition. Even at this early date, many Americans, including government officials, uh, became acquainted with the resources of the region. A map of the United States, I guess it's up there, a uh, map of the United States produced by Samuel Lewis in 1795 showed copper mines to exist on the south shore of Lake, uh, Lake Superior. Four years later, New York Congressman William Cooper had specimens of this uh, metal in his possession and brought them to the attention of Congress. The assayer of the United States tested some of the samples and reported that this copper was pure, malleable copper fit for manufacturers. At this time, the economy of the nation needed a local source of copper because an Anglo-French war had restricted importation of British copper. Congress authorized President John Adams to send an expedition to Lake Superior to confirm the presence of copper and, if true, to arrange a treaty with the Indians in order to obtain copper-rich land for the United States. Due to a series of um, unfortunate de delays, the designated leader of the expedition, Richard Cooper, the son of William, uh, never set forth. Um, very interesting, uh, they were Federalists, and Thomas Jefferson was not a Federalist, a Democrat. And even though Thomas Jefferson sent out the Lewis and Clark expedition to explore the Western country, uh, his political feeling got in the way here, and he can't, when he became president, he canceled the expedition that was kind of the Cooper expedition that was kind of sitting out there and it hadn't it hadn't been undertaken. And they they took the government took all the uh, the equipment and the boats and whatnot, and not back uh, uh, back. Um, Later in 1801, due to political considerations, yes, okay, um, so that there was a knowledge of Lake Superior copper in uh, Philadelphia and Washington, but it remained untapped. Alexander Henry, one of the earliest uh, fur traders, uh, known as peddlers from Quebec, uh, came to the Lake Superior country, and uh, he publishes in 1809, he published Travels and Adventures in Canada and the Indian Territories between the years 1766 and 1776. Uh, this is a classic. Uh, this is classic travel literature and was popular and read by many, thus expanding the knowledge of the reason, uh, region. Uh, Mackinac Island entered the federal system uh, and kind of became a. Uh, official outlet for the federal government when in 1808 uh, the Indian factory or government trading post was established uh, on the island and it uh, was created to attract native trade away from the British and it lasted until the War of 1812 was never revived. Uh, an interesting uh, individual comes on the scene here uh, Dr. Francis LeBaron, a surgeon at Fort Mackinac, and he was the next individual to question whether the copper of the Upper Peninsula could be exploited. He, ban he began his correspondence on the subject in 1809, and by September 1810, he addressed a letter to the Secretary of War, quote, on a subject which has long since occupied my mind relative to the probable existence of rich and valuable copper mines in and about Lake Superior and its navigable waters. Uh, from a long residence in the region, Dr. LeBaron had not only heard of copper deposits in the region, but had seen specimens from different locations. He concluded that with government assistance, these copper deposits could become, quote, an inexhaustible source of wealth to those who engage in the working of them, an unparalleled prosperity to this part of our Western uh, position, uh, possession. Uh, Dr. LeBaron uh, also sent specimens of copper uh, in the Western Upper Peninsula to John Davis uh, of Boston and Colonel uh, Porter, a member of Congress. 
Nothing seems to have developed from uh, LeBaron's inquiry. However, in 1810, uh, uh, Secretary of Treasury Albert Gallatin wrote, a, uh, wrote in a report, State of Domestic Manufacturers, that information about copper had appeared in library journals and other publications, and there were wide, widespread expectations for its development by Americans. Settlement in the Great Lakes country, especially in, on the southern shore, however, was slow because of the Indian hostility led by uh, Tecumseh and the Shawnee prophet. Uh, the coming of the War of 1812 brought settlement to the region to a complete halt. However, specimens of, un, of Upper Peninsula copper continue to be assayed in reports written on its purity and potential industrial use. The uh, William Eustace was uh, minister to the Netherlands uh, uh, from 18, uh, 1814 to his uh, uh, retirement in 1818. During his stay in the Netherlands, he sent specimens of Lake Superior copper to an assayer in Utrecht. Uh, a portion of the assayer's glowing report uh, stated, from every appearance, the piece of copper seems to have qualified for rolling and forging. And that is, ex and its excellence is indicated by its resemblance to the copper usually employed by the English for plating. The report continued that copper, uh, quote, had, has proved that it does not contain the smallest article of silver, gold, or any other metal. So it was pure copper. Later in 1820, Schoolcraft further noted that some of the Lake Superior copper that had been sent to the University of Leiden for analysis was found to be of uncommon purity. Uh, I could go into more detail about LeBaron, but LeBaron is going to, so he's technically a government official, though he's a medical doctor, uh, but he keeps, uh, promoting the idea of the development of the copper deposits in the Lake Superior region. And you have to remember that at this time, uh, there were Americans that were very concerned about the Western country and developing the Western country and its assets, developing the economy. And as, as Dan pointed out, uh, developing the mines and eventually settling uh, actually settling the area and bringing this area into the United States. So it was kind of out there, people knew about things, but it hadn't been sort of brought into the United States. And LeBaron continued in one of his reports, uh, quote, in a few years a colony would be formed of a hardy, industrious, and brave people attracted to the United States and forming a barrier on that frontier which would give confidence to new adventurers, adventurers and would produce a speedy settlement of the immediate territory between the shores of Lake Superior and Detroit. And he then goes into more detail about, uh, about uh, developing these copper deposits. So when you, when you talk about Cass, the people that are on the expedition, many of them were familiar with this, and this is going to be the reason for going into the area, to put that official uh, U.S. government stamp and have an official report go out. Uh, mineral resources of, of the region were not the only items discussed, discussed in scientific publications. In the summer of 1810, a youthful botanist, Thomas uh, Newtel, uh, visited and collected specimens uh, in the vicinity of Isle uh, of Mackinac Island. He eventually published his findings in 1818 under the title The Genera of New, uh, New American Plants and a Catalog of the Species to the Year of 1817. Uh, here he described three, uh, three species new to science from the Upper Peninsula, uh, a dwarf species of I iris, uh, found on the shores of uh, Northern Lake Superior in Huron, a large-headed tansy named for Lake uh, Huron, and, a thimble, and the thimbleberry occurring in the Northern Great Lakes and found in the West. 
Uh, Mackinac Island and its fort and settlement dominated the region as the major settlement in the in the upper country. In 1815, John Jacob Astor of the American Fur Company operated, uh, operated a store on the island, and for the next dozen years, the American Fur Company dominated the fur trade from the central location. At the end of 1815, on December 29th, William Puthoff established uh, the Mackinac Indian Agency on the island, predating the domination of Amer Native Americans that took place after the Cass expedition. Uh, by this time, information about the Upper Peninsula began to appear in a variety of popular publications. Uh, Andrew Miller's Immigrant Guide, titled New States and Territories, uh, in 1818 labeled the region of the Upper Peninsula as the Northwestern Territory and stated that, quote, it lies west of Michigan Territory and Lake. It is bound by Lake Michigan on the east, Superior and Grand Portage north, Mississippi River west, Illinois Territory south. As if to paraphrase early chroniclers, Miller wrote, the territory derives its chief importance at present from its mines, wild game, fish, fowl, and wild rice. Uh, vir virgin copper, he continued, has also been found in several places and iron ore. In 1819, uh, Daniel Blow published a geographical, commercial, and agricultural view of the United States, uh, again calling the Upper Peninsula the Northwest Territory. Writing about Point or Pen, uh, he noted that shipbuilding continued to be carried out there and that there were places along the St. Mary's uh, River that had the potential of becoming mill sites. Uh, neither Mackinac Island nor the copper deposits were forgotten. He noted that his British audience should not be surprised to learn that Americans were finally entering the region to work the copper deposits and that the British should take heed of the possibilities. Finally wrote that in, the, in November 1816, a company was formed in the United States to develop these deposits which, in, quote, ensures the future commercial consequence of this territory. Uh, the third and last descriptive study of uh, the Upper Peninsula to be reviewed uh, was a uh, pedestrian tour of 4,000 miles through the western states and territories during the winter and spring of 1818, a result of a trip by uh, Eswick Evans. In his work, he described uh, Mackinac Island praised its fish. The, Mackinac, the Michelin Mackinac trout are bred in Lake uh, Michigan and are celebrated for their size and excellence, sometimes weighing 60 to 70 pounds. Uh, he continued the tract of country lying between Lake, Superior, uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior is rather sterile. The falls of St. Mary uh, situated in the strait between Lake Huron and Superior are mere cascades. In this strait, there are many. There are several islands. Uh, below the falls, situated the site of Fort St. Mary, in this strait are caught fine fish of many kinds. Uh, he went on to write of the Native Americans and ended up saying, uh, the, vicinity, "The vicinity of this place, Sault Ste. Marie, is a perfect wilderness." So what you have occurring here then is a great deal of knowledge uh, coming, to, uh, coming on the scene and much of this knowledge was uh, understood by American officials, uh, all sorts of people, manufacturers and so on, uh, who wanted to develop the United States and open it. And you have all sorts of uh, reports and, and discussion uh, uh, between Cass and, uh, and other officials, uh, uh, John Calhoun, the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of War, uh, saying that, that they want this expedition to go out and to, to make sure that everything that has been written and so on gets sort of the U.S. government seal of approval and that the area be, uh, be developed. So uh, as was pointed out and as you'll see in the exhibit, uh, 
the Cass expedition was not like the Lewis and Clark expedition that went out to, a, uh, to an unknown territory, but they were going through a territory that was known and had been known for a long period of time, but they just were giving the official stamp of approval by the, uh, uh, by the federal government. So I don't know, do we have time for some questions? Thank you, Russ. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Russ? Uh, use the microphone because we have people watching online. Uh, you mentioned that the expedition was five months. What was that five month time period? What were the months? They left in May of 1820, returned in September of 1820. Any other questions for Russ or myself? Well, I'll, I'll talk about that more in, my next, in the next presentation, but does anyone have any questions for Russ or comments? Russ, I, I have a question. The ship that they built at Point de Pine or uh, Pine Point, how large was that ship? Do you know? Uh, those uh, the, uh, the specifics about a lot of these ships are, are really unknown. Uh, they didn't keep any records, and a lot of times they're mentioned at about that time that they were sailing on Lake Superior. But it was, uh, they would, the, the ship, the one in 1735 was to be large enough to carry uh, copper because uh, Iran was developing copper at uh, Antnagan. His idea was that the fur traders were busy in the summertime gathering furs. The winter, they had nothing to do. They could become miners and mine copper. And then in the spring, when the ice broke, uh, send the ship to Sault Ste. Marie and, and get the copper out of the area. So it would have been large enough to carry a profitable supply of, of copper, frequent supplies of copper. After that point, were there always, I mean, was that the only sailing vessel on Lake Superior for many decades, or were there more that were built and used over well, the they, next decades? Well, they did build one in 1780, uh, 1786, the Athabasca. Uh, what was happening was the British and the Northwest Company, uh, operating out of Montreal, had established, they kind of stayed on the north side of the lake, and they had established a, uh, a major post uh, at, um, what, oh, anyway, south of Thunder Bay, just across the- Fort uh, William, right? Uh, yeah, it was, at the time, it was Fort William uh, up in Thunder Bay, and they had Grand Portage, mm -hmm. and they, and that, and then, uh, so the Northwest Company was providing information, developing the area, uh, and then when, the, when they finally got the boundary uh, uh, you know, worked out, uh, they moved then, to f then created Fort William uh, several dozen miles to the north beyond the, beyond the boundary. But the Northwest Company was building ships and had active, active fur trade uh, certainly between Sault Ste. Marie and Grand Portage. Okay, thank you. We got a question over here. I was interested in your comment about uh, the British French War interrupted copper uh, distribution. Who were the competitors? Where else was copper found? before we discovered it here in the United States. Is it all over the place? There were, yeah, there were numerous uh, sites and locations, you know, in Europe uh, where you had a supply of copper. What happened with that, with, with the war, you say, well, why was that a problem? You should have included it. The uh, bottoms of ships were lined with copper to try to control the, uh, the sea worms and whatnot that would burrow into the wood. And so it becomes a wartime materiel to cover your ships, especially your warships, uh, with copper. And so all of a sudden the British said, hey, we can't, we can't sell this war material to anyone. And so all of a sudden the United States 
who was using it, you know, using copper to make uh, utilitarian items and so on, and for ships, uh, didn't have a supply of copper, and this caused a big problem. Didn't the the uh, restriction didn't last too long? The war ended, and the copper uh, continued. Uh, possibly, if you know, and and that expedition, the uh, the Cooper the Cooper expedition. Uh, if that had been successful and they had developed it, developed all the, the settlement and all, uh, you would have had the development of the copper country uh, many, many years earlier, decades earlier. But the, the war kind of brought the demand to an end and as I said, President uh, Jefferson did not, did not want his political opponents, uh, the Federalists, to get any credit, and so his interest in the environment, the unknown uh, regions of the United States, all of a sudden were thrown aside for political reasons. Thank you. Are there any other questions? With uh, there being so much uh, French um, seeming influence in the region of Lake Superior with the Voyagers and the Jesuits. Was, uh, did France have any official or unofficial uh, policy about this area? The, uh, uh, the French viewed uh, the Lake Superior area, this area, as part of the empire. And as a matter of fact, in 1671, in June 1671, they had a major event, a very official event. Uh, there was a, a group of soldiers were there in their dress uniforms. They put up a cross. They put up the French standard. Uh, they had a Jesuit explain to the Indians what would happen if they didn't go along with this. And, uh, you know, uh, troops, the number of the stars in the sky will descend upon you from France. So join up, folks. And they brought many, many in, uh, Native American leaders to this event. And at that point, they officially claimed the North Country as part of France. And, and so it was, it was part, of, uh, part of France. Uh, the Jesuits were, were never employed agents of France to uh, you know, find out about the environment and so on and so on, but the information that they provided uh, went into uh, you know into the French Empire. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, good. Is this or was this a class at Northern? Is it what? Uh, this like stuff about the UP and this history was it was it, was it was it ever a class of Northern? I see you were a teacher at Northern. No, I didn't. I, I didn't get the one part. Or a class? Did you ever teach this this material at Northern? Yeah, I taught the history of the UP. Is it okay? It is a class. And it's uh, I've done I've done articles on many of the topics I talked about, and then I have a history of the Upper Peninsula that's available. Does it is, it is it still offered or? Uh, it's being offered in uh, the in the winter winter semester. Uh, Catherine Johnson is going to offer the history of the UP. So if you're interested, it's it's available will be available to you. Thank you. Yep. Um, so you mentioned earlier that the the Europeans and particularly the Jesuits were approaching this region with a a religious like missionary kind of background or like guiding ideal, right? Um, I'm curious when the Americans started exploring this territory and, and you talked about how it wasn't from like a discovery standpoint, it was more of a trying to find um, like copper and fur trade and like an economic standpoint. Was there a religious aspect to American uh, interaction with the indigenous people as well? Or was it purely, we're trying to find copper, we're trying to find a fur trade, we're trying to get an economic value from this land? No, what, what's going to happen and, and uh, <clears throat> what is going to happen with the, with the Cass expedition, that's, and that's why it becomes very important. With the Cass expedition, 
uh, Fort Brady is established, so a military post is established at Sault Ste. Marie to guard the frontier, and there was a chain of forts uh, that went from Sault Ste. Marie all the way in a big arc to uh, New Orleans, basically New Orleans, guarding the frontier. And then at that point, with the coming of the US government into the area, things changed. Relationships between Native Americans and the mixed blood people, the Metis and so on, uh, uh, comes apart. And uh, you're going to find that uh, the, uh, the government then wants the Indians assimilated so you be in, there's a Reverend uh, Abel Bingham, uh, who is a Baptist uh, missionary, and he comes in as kind of the first Protestant missionary in 1827, soon after the, uh, the expedition. And then you have, other, uh, you have other missionaries coming in during the American period. Uh, there are Methodists that come into the Sioux and establish a mission at uh, um, Lantz, uh, and then uh, you have later on, uh, about the same time, you have uh, Father Baraga, Frederick Baraga, a Catholic missionary coming into the area. So the, uh, really the Cass expedition is going to then bring American missionaries, among other changes, into, uh, into the area. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't a primary goal from the outset for them. No, they, they didn't talk about it. When, when they're talking about the Cass expedition, there's no talk about missionary activity. The government, the government only saw it when you were talking about settling the area and how to bring the Native Americans under to be assimilated and become Americans. And at that point, then the government would send in the missionaries as assim, uh, assimilators uh, assimilating the Indians into the American society, promoting agriculture, for instance, uh, uh, bring, uh, uh, Reverend uh, Bingham uh, is going to have farms, he's gonna get the Indians to develop farms at Sault Ste. Marie. But that was not in any of the reports as they're talking about uh, the expedition, that, that it was for religious reasons. It was sort of a secondary, secondary reason that, that developed. Thank you. Actually, Marty Reinhardt will be talking about that this afternoon, so you, you'll want to be here for that. Well, thank you very much, Russ. Uh, we're going to take five minutes for people to get drinks and use the bathroom and or whatever, and uh, then I'll start up, okay? Thank you very much, Russ. Let's hear from Russ. Great job. <laughs>